Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I trust that you have enjoyed the first few videos that we have made available lately, which is part of what we are thinking of as a, a year long version of the World Science Festival programming, much of it online. So we had Does Math Reveal Reality? We had our language program, Mind Your Language. And indeed, it was one of you in the audience who named that program. So thank you very much. We also had the live conversation with Max Tegmark in which a number of your questions about math and reality, we pushed it a little bit forward in that one-on-one -on -one conversation. It has been an exciting week for science. I trust that many of you are following the news. This is the Nobel Prize week where new Nobel laureates are being announced. And indeed, we are going to have a series of conversations with some of the newly minted laureates in the coming weeks. And indeed, that's what we are doing here today. And just to get us into the subject for today's conversation, look, I think we've all, not I think, I know that we all have the experience of engaging with the world, with our senses, touching something that's hot or it's cold or eating something that's spicy, we can feel it, or or perhaps overeating and, and feeling the effects of that within our bodies. And, and, and one of the deep questions that scientists have struggled with over the course of many decades is, how do we do that? What is the molecular machinery by which the human body is able to sense the environment with such precision and nuance? Can we reduce those physical processes to molecular motions that are responsible for the sensations that we all have. And on Monday, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was announced for two scientists whose work has spectacularly advanced our understanding in that arena of science, that arena of questioning David Julius and Artem Potapudian. And we are thrilled to have a conversation with both of the scientists here today. I'm gonna to begin with David Julius, who joins us from his home outside of San Francisco. So David, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Pleasure to be here. And, and again, you know, enormous congratulations on this award. We'll get into the science in just a second, but I sort of can't resist asking you, you know, what was it like to get, you know, that, that phone call early yeah. in the morning, your time? Uh, you know, it's, um, you hear about this from other people who've gotten Nobel Prize and you just kind of, you know, it's always interesting and fun to read. When it happens to you, it's still a bit of an out of body experience. And uh, yeah, it was quite thrilling. And, um, you know, things start happening at two in the morning, at least West Coast time. And then, you know, everything breaks loose from there. So you don't really get back to bed or anything for quite a long time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have to say that um, the Nobel Prize is still sort of the preeminent prize that's recognized around the world. And it brings in so much attention, uh, you know, and and at that level, it is wonderful to see how interested people still are in science and what's happening in terms of scientific advances. It's really, I think that's the most miraculous and wonderful thing about prizes and about the Nobel in particular, is that it does at least for a week, focus a lot of people's attention on recent advances or well, advances that happened a while ago, but you know, recent description of those advances to the public, uh, to everybody so that they can really kind of connect with science. Yeah, really no, it's, great. it's enormously exciting. And, and I agree with you, one of the things that, at, keeps me going, gets me up in the morning, is the fact that in an, an arena and in a world in which we know that there's a lot of backlash against expertise in science and scientists, mm -hmm. the fact that there is a deep interest in the kinds of work that's being done at the frontier is of course gratifying to all of us who, who are engaged in the pursuit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can jump in to the work of yours that was awarded with the Nobel Prize. So, so your, your interest is understanding how the body senses things like heat and cold. Um, where, where did that 
interest come from? Was it sort of as a kid you were thinking about that, or is this something that happened a little <laughs> later in your career? Yeah, during my career, you know, so when I was in uh, an undergraduate and graduate school, of course, I worked in laboratories, particularly as a graduate student. And, you know, in those days, I worked on very different things than what this prize is about and that what we've worked on since I've had my own lab. Uh, there were also fascinating, you know, I think pieces of biology, but, you know, that training then led up to what I, I've done since I've had my own lab. And um, when I started my own lab, I uh, and when I actually did my postdoctoral training for that, I became interested in the nervous system. And, you know, in particular, one of the things that really got me interested about the nervous system was um, understanding how uh, natural products affect our behavior and our nervous system. And so when I was a graduate student, uh, I started thinking about, um, you know, how do things like hallucinogens work and why do people use thing, uh, you know, extracts from peyote and other uh, plant products for ritualistic, um, you know, ceremonies and, you know, how do humans discover these things and then how do they exploit them either for, you know, culinary purposes or for, you know, ritualistic purposes. And then of course, uh, how do scientists then use this kind of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, folk medicine type information to mine the active ingredients in these things and then use them to really tap into important signaling processes in the brain and the spinal cord and other places. And I really got fascinated by that intersection of sort of, it's kind of like chemical anthropology in science. And, um, and so that sort of has carried through since I've had my own lab. And, uh, and, and, and that sort of intersected with my growing interest in understanding sensory systems in general. But can Many I just jump are, in? Cause I yeah. can't resist asking, was yeah. all that was happening in like the sixties and early 70s, <laughs> was that at all an influence well, on that? I, I sometimes tell the story, which is a true one, that when I was a graduate student, I, I did I worked in in some wonderful labs and did yeast genetics and biochemistry. And that meant late one night I was waiting for this huge vat, this fermenter vat of, of yeast to come to the right, you know, cultured the right density to uh, mature. And so I was just sort of killing some time lying on a bench outside the biochemistry building in Berkeley. And these two guys walked up to me, it must have been close to midnight. And they said, Hey, man, about uh, 10 years ago, you know, we got some incredible LSD from somebody <laughs> <laughs> in this building. And uh, I think some uh, entrepreneurial chemists have been synthesizing some of that stuff, um, probably when it was still legal. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they said, is there any more around? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, these guys, these denizens of Berkeley have been wandering around probably for a decade, you know, thinking of, of, of this as their primary goal. And then I started thinking about, wow, you know, this stuff really has a quite a profound effect on people's behavior. So you could and, Walter White, man, this could have been the, yeah, the beginning of yeah, your exactly. career. Right? <laughs> so so that really did get me intrigued. And uh, and I was about, about to, um, you know, wrap up my Ph.D. and wonder what I was going to do in the future. And so I started reading all these books and, and papers by great scientists like Saul Snyder and, uh, and Agaj George Agajanian, who worked on serotonergic systems, which interact with LSD and things like that. I even read some books by uh, uh, the uh, notable Timothy Leary. Yeah. And, um, you know, that really sort of uh, sparked my curiosity. And so from there, I did actually go to Richard Axel's lab in New York to work on the molecular biology of neurotransmitter systems, serotonin receptors, et cetera. Uh, but once I started my own lab, I sort of carried over that interest, but I got interested in sensory systems. Yeah. And, uh, and in particular, understanding the re where this all comes together is understanding how we sense pain and what are the molecular mechanisms that allow us to detect painful stimuli. So, of course, as you know, that's an important component of the somatosensory system or what we colloquially refer to as touch. Uh, uh, you know, aside from light touch, uh, temperature sensation, there's pain, which in some ways is kind of a uh, enhanced version of those other modalities, but it also includes sensitivity to things like chemical irritants, both in the environment and, 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 and chemical agents, so-called algogenic agents, things that enhance our sense of pain that are produced from within when we have inflammation. Yeah. And, you know, we really got interested in my lab in understanding what the basis for that kind of sensation uh, was and uh, you know touch was at that time sort of the the lagging sensory system about which we knew the least compared to vision olfaction hearing etc so uh, it was well, kind is, of a is that because 
is that because the the other senses, you know, sight and sound, mm -hmm. taste, they're localized in the body. So does yeah, that sort of exactly our attention yes. in a simpler problem in some sense? In a way, I mean, they're all complex problems, and I don't want to minimize the beautiful work <laughs> and the history of those fields. They're really momentous, but. Um, in part, yes, you know, if you want to, people like George Wald and others, if they want to understand, when they want to understand what the proteins are in the retina that uh, that respond to photons, they go to the slaughterhouse and get a bucket of cow eyeballs and do some great bucket biochemistry on that. Uh, the other thing, too, is that, you know, there was some, um, based on, on those studies and then, um, you know, biochemical and pharmacological studies, there were some hints and insights into what types of molecules might be involved, for example, in olfaction mm. uh, that allowed Richard Axel and Linda Buck to do their amazing studies and have a directed approach to use uh, PCR methods to look for a particular class of proteins, namely G protein coupled receptors that they thought would be uh, the key odorant receptors, which turned out to be the case. You know, in touch sensation and pain, we really didn't have that kind of insight to understand what class of molecules might be involved. Right. Uh, and so the search was much more open-ended. And, you know, when you think about vision and olfaction, they're very complex, but they basically use the same platform. And the same is true for taste in a way, uh, to some degree. They use the same platform of, of molecular signaling devices, mostly based on G-protein coupled receptors. Um, in, in the studies that we've done and that Artem has done, that's turned out to be important, but not directly in terms of detecting stimuli. So. So there weren't as many genetic uh, or biochemical leads, and that really meant that we had to take approaches that were different. So without a bucket of cow eyeballs, mm -hmm. I gather <laughs> you went to a different stimulant, namely chili peppers, right? Is that right? That's the yeah. direction you went. So just uh, what 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 led you to that? And my specific question also is, if you're interested in in understanding heat, which I gather mm -hmm. was part of the motivation. I would have thought naively that you would have gone like for a flame or for, you know, right. or why go for yeah. a chemical that in some sense seems to emulate, but not mm -hmm. yield higher kinetic energy thinking as a flat footed right. physicist. That's what we mean by yeah. higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That approach? yeah, exactly. Well, um, you know, dealing with, with physical stimuli is a little bit more difficult in the laboratory. Um, and so what we did was to convert a physical problem to a chemical problem mm -hmm. by finding and 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 the and the chemicals that we have used which we'll talk about in a section second are actually quite potent and strong at stimulate and you know to be to be honest we did not know when we initiated this that so we used as you know capsaicin the pungent ingredient from chili peppers to find the first of these ion channels and at the outset we did not really know that this would lead us to a molecular device that was central to detecting heat. Mm. I mean, in retrospect, sure. it sounds so cogently beautiful. Uh, there's this sort of, you know, uh, merging of, 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 of uh, sensory experiences. And of course, we described chili peppers as being hot. So in retrospect, it's sort of obvious. But, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, equally possible and turns out to be true in some ways that this receptor that's uh, that sees capsaicin could also be activated by a chemical agent, and there are there are many, for example, endogenous lipid-like compact lipid-derived messengers, uh, bioactive lipids, that do mimic the actions of capsaicin by binding to the same site, the so-called vanilloid site, uh, and um, and that's an important uh, stimulus to this channel as well. But that could have occurred and, and been important for the generation of pain responses, even if this channel were not itself heat sensitive. So, uh, you know, we really realized that this channel was a very heat sensitive channel after we, we cloned it. But the reason that we started with capsaicin really has to do with history in the field. And that is, as well as, you know, uh, natural products and, um, and, uh, and folk medicine. You know, we all know, of course, we experience this hot burning sensation and that's intriguing enough. But um, people uh, before us, uh, mostly uh, folks like Jansko Gabor in, in Hungary in the 60s and 70s, had shown that capsaicin is a very potent excitatory agent for a subset of sensory neurons that were believed to play a role in pain sensation, these so-called nociceptors. And so for many years, capsaicin sensitivity to capsaicin became sort of a functional hallmark for those neurons. So 
there had been a goal, in fact, I would call it sort of a holy grail of, of understanding how capsaicin works in the pain field, you know, many years before we became involved in this I see, area. I see. And, and what was lacking was, you know, real molecular and mechanistic insight into how capsaicin worked. So how did you, uh, uh, how did you, how did you approach that? I mean, so you've got, um, well, uh, again, you know, there wasn't much to work on and we, we, we did sort of take a flyer on this, but well, what we did was we used, um, what's called heterologous gene expression methods to see if we could take an ordinary fibroblast like cell in culture. It's actually a kidney derived cell line called HEK293 and see if we could render it sensitive to capsaicin by transferring in a gene or genes that would, uh, you know, provide the apparatus that was necessary for this. And so there are several unknowns. One is that using this technique, if it's more than one gene that's yeah. involved, your chances of finding it decrease substantially. Exponential. So we were, yeah. we were lucky that there was one gene. And then in fact, for Artem, uh, that was uh, lucky in some regards too, that one gene product was enough to I mean, were you worried? Uh, recapitulate mechano sensation. Yeah. <laughs> You're always worried in science. Yeah. <laughs> there's always some risk involved. Yeah, I mean, because there's, it, it, yeah. in some sense, we it's a bit of a shot. That. It's a bit of a shot in the dark to assume that it's a single it gene that yeah. would yield this sensitivity to this kind True. of stimulant, right? Yeah, we we were worried, um, but you know, there had been other things that we had that I had worked on in the past when I was a postdoc, where we I took a similar, uh, you know, risk in it and it worked. But yes, you're right. You know, someone could have worked on this for quite a while. We did have some backup plans to try and figure out how we might approach this if it turned out to be a multi-gene complex, but that would have been much more difficult. So we got would, lucky. Would you have taken on that project? I assume you're already tenured and, and, and had security. Is this the kind of project that you would have taken on, say, as a, as a graduate student or postdoc? Or Yes, absolutely. Would. And in fact, um, I encouraged Mike Katerina, who was the fellow in my lab, to do this. And I said, this is going to be risky, but if it works, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. And I would have not encouraged him to do that if I myself were not willing to do it when I was at his stage. So, uh, and you know, the thing is that we knew that we would devote a certain amount of time to this. And, um, if it didn't work, you know, you'd have to pull your head up and say, okay, what's next. And I think that's just part of doing science, you know, yeah, you take some risks. Most of what you do is going to fail. You know, that going, of course. Into it. Yeah. If and, um, you know, if it gets you out of bed in the morning and it's the most exciting thing that you can think about doing, that's what you want to do. If one gene had not seemed to work, would you have continued yeah. to enlarge the universes, uh, universe of genes you considered, or would you have gone to two to try to find the right combination? Or would um, you, like you say, have sort of turned to something else? Yeah, so so the way we did this and kind of the uh, Occam's razor, this is that you don't just look at one gene at a time when you do this. You make a, a, a gene library, what we call a cDNA library at the time, and you introduce genes into these, you know, fibroblasts and culture on mass in bulk. Mm. And so we did this so that at any given, any given what we call transfection, that's introducing the DNA to the cells in a dish, that collection of cDNAs numbered in about 10,000. But, you know, you have to kind of adjust this so that um, it's big enough so that the probability that your gene of interest or genes of interest will be in there um, are, uh, is, is, you know, significant, but not so big that things are diluted out so much that the sensitivity drops so that you can't see it. So there comes a tipping point there. But if you make the pool large enough and the, and the gene is expressed at a high enough level, there is the chance that even if there were multiple genes that you could introduce them rarely, but into one cell simultaneously. And, and there are examples of that through different techniques and not just cDNA, but genomic expression. This is, for example, how um, the recombinases for, uh, for um, immunoglobulins, the so-called RAG genes were identified by Marianne Ottinger in David Baltimore's lab. That, that's a, that's a two gene affair two protein affair and and she got fortunate in that those genes were linked together closely on the chromosome and so when she did what we call whole genome transfection which would have been another way to do this she was lucky enough to get both of those proteins in one cell simultaneously but you know you need luck for that yeah. and the chances go down substantially but you know we got lucky and uh and we and the other question was how do you detect this event you know, what's the best way to do that? Because yeah. it's all in the assay, right? Like everything else in, in, in biology, it's all in the assay. And, um, and there had been uh, indications in the literature 
a lot of this stuff had been published actually in abstracts uh, from meetings of, say, the British Pharmacological Society of people who had patch clamp uh, done electrophysiological recordings from sensory neurons and had evidence that when you put capsaicin on these cells, uh, you know, you increase ion flow across the membrane, which is what you'd expect, and that this included the entry of calcium into the cell. So at the time, uh, there were um, systems, albeit crude compared to today, to be able to leverage uh, the um, beautiful reagents of a another Nobel laureate, the, um, the late uh, Roger Chen, that um, are dyes that bind calcium and then fluoresce in the cell uh, when calcium levels go up. And what this meant is we could load these cells in a dish with these with this calcium so-called calcium indicator called Fura, and then use a microscopic assay to look for cells that that glowed right. when you put capsaicin on them as a as a measurement of calcium influx. And so that was another risk in that uh, you know we were hoping that uh, this was actually the case that we would see permeability of the membrane to calcium ions on a rather fast time scale that would allow us to detect this. Uh, and so what Mike did when he was in my lab was he sort of mocked up these situations with receptors that were known to increase calcium in the cell to see how big our pool could be, what the sensitivity was. Our system at the time was was rather low uh, sensitivity, so we really had to kind of be careful about that. Uh, and then once we had those things in place, you know, the receptor actually, the clone for the capsaicin receptor fell out in fairly short order. It only took about a month of screening. Right. And, and, and so is it clear in retrospect, the issue that you said that perhaps you should have thought of at the outset, why is the response to this particular chemical, capsaicin mm -hmm. and, and chili yeah. peppers, why is it the same as the response to molecules moving more quickly, heat? Why, why are oh, they conflated? Well, that's an accident of evolution, right? It is. So the chili pepper uh, makes this compound, you know, just... Uh, presumably, it's been selected for because it um, averts predatory mammals like squirrels and deer. And um, and and uh, and and how does it do that? It's evolved through the accident of convergent evolution to act on a receptor that we have in our bodies that we use for something else. Mm. Um, and so, uh, conveniently for the pepper plant, it's figured out in evolutionary time how to make this thing to generate pain. Of course, we as humans like to do things that, you know, hurt us in some ways, like smoke cigarettes and drink sure. alcohol. So we like to consume chili peppers. And, um, and uh, you know, th so this receptor in mammals has evolved a pocket that binds this, uh, you know, pungent agent. And why is the pocket there in our channel? That's what one might ask. And I think the reason is that that pocket exists to appreciate and bind endogenous inflammatory agents like bioactive lipids that alter the sensitivity of the channel to heat and thereby contribute to pain hypersensitivity when there's injury. Now, interestingly, not all animals have that. And there's a really interesting phenomenon of what uh, this, this uh, ecologist, Jonathan Tewksbury, has called directed deterrence. And, and, and as far as I know, this situation is sort of the main example of that. And that is that birds can eat chili peppers with impunity. They are very have very low sensitivity to capsaicin so, and presumably yeah. And well, well, then how does the body know to respond really negatively when your hand's in a flame and mm -hmm. not to respond so negatively if you've just done too much of the hot sauce at, you know, at, at those tacos? You know, how does it distinct? Oh, well, sometimes we do respond negatively. It's sort of, you know, there's a lot of behavior involved in pain and pain sensation. And some of it's anticipatory and knowing what you're getting yourself into, right? Um, and we learn through experience, right? So, but you can get yourself into trouble, of course, with eating, you know, too much chili much pepper, of anything, especially really. in your GI tract. Yeah. Or, you know, if you chop a hot chili pepper and then stick your finger in your eye, oh, that's not an enjoyable experience. Or, or breathe and it so, in, which I did or, once. Right, in the hills of time. Exactly. By mistake, it was quite. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you can you can go into basically what's like, uh, you know, uh. A, a severe, what's almost like an allergic reaction in your lung. Right. And, um, and so um, I think it depends on context, right? And, and this is why we can also distinguish between when we've actually eaten a chili pepper or touched something hot, because there's context to the experience. Right, right. And I think that plays a big role in any sensory system, particularly in pain sensation. So how close would you say we are, or maybe we're actually there, 
to mm -hmm. really being able to describe, you know, right down at the level of fundamental particles, you know, electrons, protons, neutrons, even yeah. quarks, yeah. and the fundamental forces, in this case, the electromagnetic force being the dominant one. To what extent can we actually give a, a first principles fundamental explanation of what happens when we touch something that's hot or eat something that's mm -hmm. spicy? Yeah, well, we're definitely much closer. I'd say one of the things that's brought us a lot closer to that is being able to see these channels in atomic three-dimensional space. So, you know, using these methods like pre uh, predominantly electron cryomicroscopy, which is kind of revolutionized structural biology, we can see these channels, including the piezo channels that Artem's worked on and the trip channels we've worked on in near atomic resolution. Yeah. And, um, and that tells us at least how these channels change their shape and open up to allow ions to go through, particularly uh, for trip channels in the context of chemical activators like capsaicin, because that's just an easier thing to do uh, than to see changes that are induced by heat. But recent studies um, by a number of labs, including um, Sasha Sobolewski's lab in Columbia, have now been trying to combine these techniques to look at changes that actually happen in these channels when they're subjected to uh, changes in ambient temperature. And that will tell us really about how the channel opens and closes as a function of ambient temperature. And, and, and is, then so is it a single channel that is tempered that works for all temperatures or do different things? kick? No. So, so the other natural product we've taken advantage of is, uh, is one from the mint plant called menthol, which we all know is a nice cooling agent. Yeah. Anyone who's had a mint julep or, uh, you know, shoot some spearmint gum. And, um, and that's kind of the flip side of this story. Right. It's uh, we conflate that with a cold sensation or a cooling sensation. And again, you know, that realization is based not only on our molecular findings, but on very early physiologic studies by some pioneers like Hensel and Zotterman, who were Swedish physiologists and showed that um, putting menthol on a sensory neurons of the cat tongue uh, greatly modulates their sensitivity to cold. Mm. And so in their original paper, they, they said, oh, this suggests that there's some, you know, biochemical device that is, uh, you know, appreciates these two things. And, and the cloning of that by, you know, show, bears that out, that trip M8, a, a, a distant, uh, well, a relative a molecular cousin of trip V1, also a trip channel, is a receptor for both cold and menthol. So is that just another evolutionary coincidence that both hot and cold have kind of a homologous version at the yeah. chemical stimulus? That's a great question. Um, it didn't have to be that way, <laughs> you know, but presumably these trip channels. So many of these trip channels, we don't know if they actually serve a role as, chem as thermal sen thermal sensors in vivo, but many of them are thermally sensitive. And so I think that that's a characteristic of these molecules that's been carried through at least some component of this gene family. And in, in some cases like trip V1 and trip M8, that, um, that describes a very important physiological role that they play. So when you look at these trip channels, like in retrospect, mm -hmm. do you say that things are well-designed, well-engineered? I mean, if you could do this from scratch, would you have yeah. a much more streamlined approach or did evolution sort of hit it out of the park on this one? Man, that's a very, that's a complex question. Uh, <laughs> only mother nature knows the answer to those questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can always make things simpler. Right. You know, in some ways, what I was gonna say is that this, this um, this situation with the bird channel. So, so birds are very insensitive to capsaicin. That's how we first, Sven Yurt in my lab mapped the site for capsaicin binding by comparing birds to mammals, namely the insensitive and sensitive channel. So, you know, there's an example where you have a channel that's still temperature sensitive, but you know, it doesn't respond as well to vanilloid compounds. And presumably uh, that's because it hasn't the mammalian channel has evolved to be more sophisticated to be able to appreciate other things like these bioactive lipids that fit in that pocket. So, uh, you know, I guess there are always simpler forms of these channels. Um, you know, the channel itself is, it's not a huge complex device. You know, it's a, it's a tetrameric protein that sits in the membrane and basically forms a donut. Uh, we are wondering, everyone's wondering, are there other proteins that associate with it in the cytoplasm and we and other people have always been looking for these things but in its root form and a form that where you can recapitulate of most of its known functions in an artificial situation like a transfected mammalian cell all you need is this one gene product that forms a tetrameric channel so 
I would say in some ways that in and of itself compared to say some complex transcription or replication complex uh, is a fairly simple little device. Yeah, It's neat, it's compact, and somehow it converts this energy very efficiently into a change in electrical current. Is it conceivable that another uh, life form on the planet that you haven't yet studied in detail yeah. may have realized that simpler version? Yes, it's possible. You know, um, mechanic sensation and other senses are not always carried through in terms of molecular design through evolution. Yeah. So invertebrates often, uh, um, or lower and lower eukaryotes like yeast often find different solutions to these same problems. And in invertebrate organisms, there is some carryover. This trip A1 channel, which is mostly a, a chemical sensor in our bodies. This is the wasabi receptor, as we call it. Uh, you know, it plays a role as a heat sensor in some organisms like um, fruit flies. Uh, and, um, uh, and, um, and so there are, there, there are similarities, but there, there are also, you know, maybe different molecules, cyclic nucleotide gated channels may play a role in temperature sensation in flies. So there are different ways to skin a cat, as they say. And, um, and I think in many sensory systems, uh, there are similarities, but there are, there are differences and, you know, there are different, many different sort of mechanosensors in, in, uh, in, uh, invertebrate organisms, uh, you know, uh, NOMC channels, which are more of a member of the trip channel family than yeah. piezo channels. So there are different ways to solve this problem. And, um, and while we all like to look for continuity through evolution, it doesn't mean that uh, that's always the case. Right. So when life begins to finally settle down in a year or two or three from all <laughs> of the excitement of the Nobel Prize, where, where do you see your research program going? You know, we're still so fascinated with this problem. I mean, pain, pain sensation is such a complex phenomenon and there's still so much to do and there's so much to do uh, at the level of therapeutics, which yeah. isn't, you know, our direct domain in terms of drug design or anything. But I think that will still benefit tremendously from just basic research because we still don't understand all the molecules involved. We, you know, and, and, and a big unknown still is sort of the, you know, the circuitry the wiring diagram that takes the initial signal from the primary afferent nociceptor to the spinal cord uh, and then to many areas of the brain uh, and aspects of that that relate to cognition, you know, not only just identification of the stimulus and where it's occurring on your body, but cognitive aspects of it is still so, um, you know, there's still so much to know. Uh, so we're continuing to work on that. I, you know, as a biochemist at heart, I'm still fascinated by the structure of these proteins and what they do. And, um, and so, you know, with my friend, Yifan Chang at UCSF, we're still really involved in looking at the molecular structure of these, of these molecules. I think that's gonna be really important for drug design. There are some, some impediments to using some of these antagonists to these channels, which we can talk about, but um, uh, so we still need some further research. And then, you know, the other part of my lab, my lab's always small, but the two or three people who are, or four people who are really interested in physiology, you know, we're looking at models of different pain uh, scenarios because, you know, we use this one term pain, but it's like cancer. Sure. You know, it describes a whole panoply of different chronic disorders, like migraine pain is different from, you know, inflammatory bowel syndrome pain, et cetera. And so we're looking at different models. We're doing a lot of work actually now on trying to figure out mechanisms that are involved in, in GI pain, I see. which affects a lot of people. Because yep. I think you need to know the specifics about those pathways and what types of molecules and, and those receptor cell types are involved uh, because targeting them with drugs will probably be different for different types of pain. We know that. And you know, unless we know something about those details, it's hard to really understand what to do. Do you think this research will ultimately be key to addressing the big unknown, which is mm -hmm. why do we have these inner sensations of these experiences? I mean, the body could just be completely mechanistic. You know, you touch a flame mm -hmm. and the hand pulls away right. and it's just mechanism mm -hmm. without deep sensation. Right. Where does the yes. inner world of sensation and qualia come from? Yeah, so you're asking why isn't it all just a spinal reflex? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think this relates to all sensory systems, but yeah, pain, you wonder why in particular do we need to have a cognitive component to pain? Well, some of it is a memory component because that's how we learn. Yep. And we need to, you know, why keep, you know, if, if, if pain protected us as a purely as a reflex, 
you would injure yourself again and again. I touched the hot stove. You're going to get burned even if you pull your hand away, but it's better to learn. So having, of course, a memory and a learning mechanism is critical. Um, and, you know, there are emotional components to this. Um, I think that's uh, this anticipatory stuff, you know, and that's um, both good and bad, I, pre I presume. Uh, but um, why we have those is uh, probably a better question for psychologists. But um, I think part of it is is um, is so that we have an emotional memory of these things, so that we can uh, protect ourselves and 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 protect our children to let them know, don't do this, don't do that. Sure. You know, at, at the most basic level, and of course, right. there are more complex reasons for that. But you know, that's also part and parcel of why treating chronic pain is a difficult thing because there's a, there is a big emotional component to it. And, um, and, uh, and it becomes a very complex thing for physicians to deal with. Yep. One final question. You uh, earlier noted that you went into this knowing that it was a high risk endeavor and clearly it mm -hmm. was one that's also a high reward endeavor as we see mm -hmm. right now in giving advice to young scientists who are up and coming, how, do you suggest they negotiate that balance? Yeah. Um, you know, you have to be practical at some level. You can't spread yourself too thin. And, you know, you do have to be productive. But, you know, I, I guess um, maybe now this sounds gratuitous sounding this, but saying this, but I think I've always kind of felt this way and, and hopefully acted in this way. But, you know, th doing science is a lot of work, uh, like anything that you're kind of passionate about. Um, and I think it's sort of a shame to do that on something that you're not really excited about. So you got to kind of work on what gets you up out of bed in the morning. You know, if you're going to go to the lab and say, well, I have to do this because I said I was going to do this in my grant and I'm not really interested in it. And it's, I'm not really inspiring people in my lab to do this because I'm finding it to be droll. Um, and we all come across those situations because, you know, grant writing sort of in some ways makes you do that a little bit in terms of what you, but you know, um, one, one of the wonderful things I'd say about, at least in the US, you know, public funding through the NIH is that, you know, you write a grant and you'll be funded for that grant based in part on what you've done and what you've proposed in a way, but you know, they're rather forgiving and understanding if you don't do exactly what you said you're gonna do and instead do something that's really exciting and important. I've never seen anybody turned down, you know, in their renewal because they did something fantastic. And so I think that, you know, young people should remember that and that they should strive to do something that they're really excited about and that they know will change the landscape of the field that they're in. You know, so, uh, doing the same thing over and over and over again and moving the field incrementally uh, is, 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 shouldn't be the goal. And, and we, you know, but, but it's a balancing act and you have to do some things that follow up on what you've done because sometimes those things actually turn out to be, you know, quite interesting, even though you might not expect that. And you do have to sort of develop a body of expertise so that you can really, you know, ratchet up your game and approach things at a, at a better and better level. But at the same time, you know, you can carve off a piece of your resources and, a, and some of your time if you have people in your lab who are willing to jump off the cliff with you yeah. and take a flyer uh, because that, you know, that won't kill you if it doesn't work. Um, but to always have something that really gets you excited kind of, you know, on the shelf that you can pull down and say, you know, I'm going to start making inroads into this and see how it goes. And then if it's exciting and it really expands, you know, you can expand your research into that, turn the ship a little bit slowly and and go for that. So that's kind of always been my approach. Yeah. And, um, and that keeps me and the people in the lab, you know, really enthusiastic about stuff. Yeah, well, it's hugely important advice. So thank you for that. And congratulations again, on this well deserved recognition of the profoundly important work that you and your laboratory have been doing. And thanks so much for spending this time with us. Let us now turn to Artem Potapudian, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with David Julius, who joins us now from his office in La Jolla, California. Welcome, Artem. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Congratulations. This is a really spectacular recognition. I can't imagine how exciting it is. I mean, how, like, did you get that famous early morning telephone call? Is that how you got the word? 
kind of it was actually um ended up being a very interesting story because uh like many of us uh have um silenced our phone into do not disturb in the middle of the night and i had that and apparently i missed four calls from Stockholm. Wait, are you saying on the Nobel Prize announcement morning, you didn't think to maybe turn it on? Was it so out of your mind as a possibility? Uh, honestly, yes, especially this year. Ah. But um, uh, I think um, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say if you win other prizes, like the Kavli people talk about this, of course. But it's one thing to say you might be considered. There's probably a lot of people think they are considered. Another thing to actually get the phone call. Yeah. And it was it was a complete shock, honestly. Um, and uh, anyway, so I did I did miss four phone calls, and then somehow they had found my 94 year old father's number who lives in Los Angeles. Oh really? And he has a he has a landline, so they called him, ah. and he was. He was very angry at them first of why they're bothering him. <laughs> oh, what time is it? What time is it for him? It's like after 2 a.m. 2 a.m. 2.20, something like that. And um, they didn't tell him because they can't tell anyone but me. Ah. They just wanted my number. Oh, my. And, and he, did, he did give it to them. But as soon as he hung up, he called me. And I guess this do not disturb kind of calls um, do not apply to people who are favorites on your phone. So he was able to get through. <laughs> And, and tell me. So it ended up being a super special moment yeah. because I heard it from my 94 year old dad. Oh, man, and it was that really is, cool. That is fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. And I mean, do you feel that uh, you've been in the running for a while or is it just sort of one of those things that you just keep on a back burner and you don't let it distract you? Yeah, I think it's, it's the latter. I, I think uh, it's a healthy thing not to listen to those kind of rumors and uh, uh, again, honestly, I thought it's a possibility at some point, but to me, this, this came a bit earlier than I anticipated, and that's why it was kind of a, a bigger shock. Yeah, well, congratulations again. Now, now you, if I understand, I, I believe you grew up in, in Lebanon. Is that is that correct? That's true. So I, mean, I... Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i Armenian origin, mm -hmm. so I grew up speaking Armenian as my first language, but I, I did grow up in Lebanon. I came to U.S. when I was 18. Um, I haven't verified this, but from what people have told me, um, this is the first Nobel affiliation with Lebanon or Armenia. So wow. both those countries who have had a tough year with the economy and the war, I hear it's, this is this is a nice little bit of cheer, uh, and I'm and I'm and I'm proud to represent that. And of course, I'm a U.S. citizen now, so um, very very grateful for for this country as well. Yeah, and a hugely so. But I mean, being a role model for kids anywhere in the world, especially in a place where life can be so difficult. This must be very gratifying since that kids can look up to you and imagine that one day they might be in a position like you are in. It, it is an incredible honor and responsibility. The number of emails I've gotten from people saying, you know, I have a similar background than you and they're like 20 year olds and thinking that this, this is a possibility it really brings chills. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's really, it's really something, and I have to get used to that role, uh, and and embrace it hopefully. But it, it is, it is, it is very interesting indeed. Well, I think that's one of the most powerful thing about these awards that are recognized across the globe, the role that it puts you in. And yes, I, it is an enormous responsibility, but the impact that you can have, of course, is commensurate with that. If we can turn maybe to some of the actual science that is responsible. My favorite yeah, subject. Yes. Absolutely. So we, we just spoke with David Julius about his work in giving insight into how the body senses uh, heat and cold, understanding molecular mechanisms. You too, your work also focused on how the body senses the world, but from the standpoint of touch and pressure. Is that, is that a correct description of yes. where your focus yes. is in? So the last 10 years, the focus has been more on, on pressure sensing. Um, and um, so, yeah, the sense of touch and pain is the, is the main entry point of our interest. Um, however, uh, identifying these molecules that we did that sense pressure and turn it into chemical signal that cells understand has also led us into uh, novel areas, some expected, some not, which includes regulating blood pressure, um, 
bladder control every time you feel like you have to go to restroom these molecules are involved mm -hmm. um, and many other new uh, areas stomach fullness we're studying but also in immune cells and red blood cells all seem to be in addition to sensing chemicals which is the the main way of cells to communicate is through chemicals whether it's hormones or neurotransmitters like dopamine cells know chemicals and they know how to communicate but this is kind of the, what the prize recognized, I think, is that there's also this whole, whole other sensory system in the body that focuses on sensing physical forces such as pressure and temperature and converting them to, to a chemical signal that the cell understands. And so what was, the, what was the state of the art, say, prior to the work that you guys began to do? Is this a problem that people have focused upon for a, a while or did it begin so, with your work? Um, so, um, Jim Hutzpah, uh, Professor Rockefeller, decades ago, sure. identified that there must be this group of proteins that we study called ion channels, which are very fast signaling molecules. They do only one thing. They're either closed or they're open. When they're open, ions go through. So very simple. So he showed that these type of channels exist and must explain mechanosensing. Um, so what was not known is what are these molecules and with the human and, and, and animal genetics that, it, that, that now exist, finding the molecule is not just saying, haha, I found the molecule, which is interesting in itself, but it really opens the door because you can sequence humans and see who doesn't have uh, a normal copy, a mutant copy. You can make genetic mutations in animal models and show that, oh, this protein is required for sensing touch or pain or bladder control. And so what David's lab did for temperature, as well as us and, and pressure sensing is identify these proteins, these gene products uh, and study them in vivo, what we call it, which is in the animal. And how, I mean, I understand the basic strategy that you're describing, but how do you go about doing that? I mean, there's so many genes, so many possibilities. How do you even narrow it down to begin to focus in on what might be the right one for yeah. coding that protein? Um, I mean, you know, you know this very well, Brian, that uh, scientists always think how reductionist of an approach I can take to answer the question at hand. If you go too reductionist, you're asking irrelevant questions. If you make it too complex, you'll never get an answer. And so for us, it was just the idea to say that instead of studying these tiny neurons with very heterogeneous and difficult to manipulate, let's find a cell that grows in a test tube, which responds to mechanical force and then find it there. So that actually assumption was the key mm -hmm. to our success because we reduced the problem to finding it in a, in, a, in a test tube, in a dish instead of in the body. And once we found that cell, uh, it was a matter of deleting one gene at a time that we thought was a candidate and seeing if this activity is still there. And when it's not, we know, ah, this is the candidate. And ha like, how many genes did you have to go through? I mean, was it- So for, for this, uh, my postdoctoral fellow, Bertrand Coast, who runs his own lab now, uh, had to look at 72 candidates before he hit the correct one. And this was not an easy task. Each candidate, you know, this is not a, you ask and you get an answer immediately. It's a two day experiment for each one. So, you know, um, literally he spent a whole year of getting negative data. And then finally, the, 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 the day that he tested candidate number 72 was, was the correct one. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a great day. Now, as with David Julius, that way you describe it suggests that you were making an assumption that it was a single gene that would be responsible. Is there a chance that that assumption could have failed and you would have gone through all of the possibilities, all 72 or whatever, and none of them would have yielded the positive result? Uh, first, I should say we had 300 candidates. Okay. So we stopped at 72 because it was the Stop, correct yeah, it was one. The right one yeah. but, but absolutely, uh, it could have been a wrong uh, assumption. But the nice thing about loss of function deleting experiments is that, uh, let's say it was a protein that's made out of five genes. If uh, every single one is somewhat required for it, we would have seen it. So we, did, we weren't assuming that it's right. a single gene. We were just assuming that there is a subunit that is essential for the activity. Now that's a good point, right. So unless it were the case that there was some redundancy in the system, that, I guess that's right. what have foiled you, right? That, that, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Right, right, exactly. Uh, but that's, uh, that's great. So, so then you find the, the gene, the gene codes for some 
protein, does that then end the story? Or do you then need to actually work out the detailed mechanism at the molecular level for Absolutely. sensing pressure? It's almost the beginning of the story because you can imagine a lot of ways something X is required for Y that doesn't mean X is doing Y, right? And so the first thing we did actually make the protein in a naive cell. And if you put it there, it makes the cell mechanosensitive. So now you have necessary and sufficient. So if you knock it out, you don't see the activity, you put it somewhere naive and there is an activity. Um, after that, we've done structural studies where we know what it looks like in the, in the, in the membrane. Uh, the I mean, do you have 3D, 3D models or images? Of yeah. Uh, actually, you can actually do a show a, and tell for us. Yeah, it is a fascinating molecule. Oh, so this is what it looks like. It is, um, I'm, I'm like, I'm disoriented. Yeah, you're good. You're good right <laughs> so there. Each, 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 um, each subunit, it comes together as a copy of three of the same gene. So each of them is a different color here. And if I show you the bottom, uh, so this is the membrane. It actually bends the membrane. It sits in a bent part of the membrane and it has 38 transmembrane domains. These are these little helices that go up and down the lipid bilayer. And so it's extended like this. And when membrane stretches, this will open up and the ions start going to right in the middle there. And the stretching is from some external pressure that the, That's right. the membrane so is every time, every time you do this, you're indenting, the membrane is being stretched and it opens up a little bit, lets ions come in. Wow. And we can do this without the cell. You can put it in a bilayer and it still works. So we know it's the sensor. Got it. And, and is it the same for all living systems that have this capacity to sense pressure or does it does it I mean, there are, there are other mechanosensors, but the piezos, the one that we found, are remarkably conserved. We just actually had a paper showing that the exact homologue of this protein is in plants. It's expressed in the roots. And what they do there is they sense how hard the surface is so they can navigate to the different hardness of the, of, of the soil. And so imagine that for a while, that evolution has created the same protein for us to sense touch and for plant roots to navigate through the soil. I find that quite, quite remarkable. No, it is remarkable. You know, one thing I asked Dave, and I'm wondering what your perspective on it is, now that you have a, a clear sense of the mechanism by which we sense touch pressure, would you consider it to be an efficient engineering solution to that particular engineering challenge? I mean, did evolution do a good job at finding this way of doing it? Or now that you see it, you're like, oh, if only evolution would have found this solution, how much easier it would have been? Um, there are lots of things we don't know, but it does seem like a very efficient pressure sensor. I actually call it professional mechanosensor because like many other proteins do lots of things. They kind of are polymodal. They, they specialize to a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, all these years that we're studying this, this is just the structure, everything about it is evolved to sense tension. Um, and it seems to do a pretty good job at it. Um, one of the evolutionary costs is that it's very large. It's one of the largest ion channels identified. And does it have to be this big? Uh, those are questions that we still ask. But the fact that both in plants and human, it's approximately the same size, very large, tells you that it somehow needs to be that large. And, and, and is it the same mechanism regardless of the strength of the pressure? I mean, is there some kind of nonlinear quality where when the pressure builds up or the, you know, the, the, the force is greater that something else kicks in or is it just the same all the way through? So these are things we don't know yet, um, Brian. I think the, uh, it was a big surprise to people in the field because when they record from um, for example, muscle afferents or skin afferents or, or bladder afferents, um, they have seen very different qualities of recordings. Quantitatively, they could be rapidly adapting, they could be firing the whole time you put pressure on. And so people had assumed that there's going to be tens of pressure sensors, each specialized for a different type of sensory mechanism. But the more and more we're finding that this piezo two accounts for many of these, I don't wanna say all, oh, there's still some that are not accounted for, um, but it seems to be somehow modulated in each of specific conditions 
to uh, have slightly different properties. Uh, and lots of this is anatomy, because if you look at the anatomy of the neuronal endings that sense these, it's fascinating. So you have, for example, something called Pacinian corpuscle, which is a neuronal ending that comes in, and there's these structures, onion-like layers surrounding it, which almost seem like amplify mechanical signals. So I think you take this molecule and put it in a very specific condition, very specific anatomical environment, and you get slightly different outputs. Hmm. And is it the same? I mean, if, if the pressure turns into like cutting, if you cut your finger, is it same exact mechanism or is it, does that differ by virtue of it? Sort we of think moving it's different actually places? quite different. So um, there are individuals who do, do not have PSO2 and they do not sense touch. They do not have proprioception, this ability to close your eyes and touch your nose, but acute pain is there. So if they cut themselves, hammer hits their finger, they feel this. And this is what I'm saying. There's another uh, mechano sensor okay. there that we have not yet identified. Oh, that's that is that is fascinating. And, and so, what about the phenomenon where, you know, this phantom limb phenomenon, where you know people lose a limb but they still feel like it itches or there's pressure on it? Does does your work give insight into that? Um, a little bit. So pain is very complex. Uh, as I've said before, uh, pain is an emotion, right? Mm. And so in the field, we dissociate pain, which is a feeling and emotion from what we call nociception, which is the transduction of uh, noxious stimuli into electrical signals. And so what you're describing is actually is a neuropathy in a way where in the absence of stimulation, the finger is not even there, the pain is still there. So one of the data points that suggest that this peripheral stuff is related to that. Um, let's say you don't have hand and you give anesthetic at the nub of where it is. This neuropathic pain, phantom limb goes away while the anesthetic is there, which means that it is in the brain, but it's modulated from yeah. the periphery. So it's amplified, misinterpreted maybe, but it is still coming from there because the nerve is cut. You know, we often think about how the body responds to stimuli in the external world. You know, someone hits you hard and you respond to that, eyes open wide, heart beats fast. There's all sorts of bodily responses that influence your interpretation of what that touch, that pressure was. Is that nonlinear? Could it be the case that you can simulate a certain kind of reaction by simply getting the heart beating faster and there's no actual danger in the world, but yet the body will respond to some sort of touch in a way that it would have if it were actually in danger? Is there that nonlinear interplay feedback mechanism? Absolutely. I think um, I actually believe that your nervous system uh, fools you into thinking you feel this and that. And so it is gathering this information about temperature and pressure, but during evolution, it's evolved to realize that the best way to tell you how to react is to make you feel a certain way, but it's not necessarily what you're feeling exactly in that area. Yeah, yeah. Um, I give the idea of urination um, without getting into too much details. When you have to go, you feel it in a certain place, but the real mechanical force is in your bladder. You're not feeling your bladder, you're feeling it somewhere else. That's, I think, a very good example of how your brain wants you to go to the restroom and makes you feel in a way that would want you to do that. That's not necessarily what you're feeling. So it's all a simulation in a way of, 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 of what the brain thinks you should do. And so what you're feeling is not necessary. It's a, it's a representation of the external world. It's not a photograph of the external world. Yeah, so that naturally takes me to a question. I also asked David Julius this question, but wonder if you have any thoughts on it. It's one thing, to understand the deep mechanisms of how we sense heat or cold or pressure or touch. It's another thing to understand how it is that those channels, those mechanisms yield the inner sensations that we feel about those things. Because again, it could have just been a completely mechanical set of processes that did not yield any inner sensation, any inner qualia. Do you think that the insights that, that you and, and David and your groups have provided, will they yield 
ultimately a deeper insight into why we experience these external stimuli in the way that we do? I think so. It's going to take a little bit of time, but absolutely. I think um, the way I think about it is they're, they're a handle on the question. If you don't have this, how are you even going to ask that question? Um, I've, I've often compared to what we do is, is it's, it's a handle door to the room. If you don't know where it is and it's a dark room, you're never going to find out. But this is a marker that we can hold on. We have experiments. We can say that you can activate this and see what happens in the brain. You activate a neighboring thing, see what happens. You can block this. So we have tools now to start asking those questions of um, the transduction all the way to the perception. I'm not saying it's straightforward or sure. will be figured out in the next year, but without this, it would be very difficult to pursue that question. So you also began to describe some of the work that you're doing now, even though the work that's being recognized perhaps happened a little while ago. What is next? Where do you think all this is headed? Um, so two things. I mean, one of it is translational. We want to see if modulating these channels could have uh, benefits to neuropathic pain or other forms of um, clinically relevant indications. The other one is um, I'm very excited about, and I feel like till now we answered the question of um, expected pressure sensing systems uh, we've explained or in the process of explaining. But what following these molecules are telling us is this whole other area of biology that we didn't suspect pressure sensing is involved. For example, very recently we found that immune cells actually actively sense pressure. And this affects how much they gobble up other cells. And if this process goes wrong, your blood iron levels get modulated very strongly. And so this whole idea of immune cells, phagocytosis, regulating blood iron levels, hmm. uh, five years ago, I would have not even imagined pressure sensing has any role in this whatsoever. And, but that's the, again, the advantage of finding these molecules and pathways through human genetics and mouse genetics. We're just discovering novel biology that depends on pressure sensing that again was completely ignored. And, and thinking more broadly now, just to your own career and obviously the success that you have and continue to enjoy, when you talk to younger scientists, how do you help them navigate the difficult questions of, do you work on something that has an obvious answer and you just have to work it out versus do you take you know, this, this chance on something that could yield nothing, but you know, high risk, high reward? How do you navigate that decision? I, I think for me, uh, one thing very clear is to obviously um, ask a question that as important, as um, transformative as possible, but with a huge but, but that today we have the tools either developed or close to developing that can answer the question. You know, many people have tried to answer the consciousness question in the nervous system, and we still don't really have the tools to answer it. And lots of ex Nobel laureates have worked on it and haven't made too much of an advance. So I think it's this uh, overlap of how transformative an open question you find, but overlap with that, is it the right time and the right place with respect to the scientific tools we have to address it? And that's num my number one advice with respect to what you're asking is to find that sweet spot. Yeah. And when you think back to being, you know, a young child growing up in Lebanon, what would you say to the young kids who are now in the shoes that you once occupied decades ago regarding you know, the possibilities of, of life, a life in science and the potentials that their future can hold? Uh, dream big, I guess, and be open to, open to experiences and change. Don't be scared of change. Perfect advice. So again, congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us. And the explanations really certainly helped me and I know our audience understand more fully what you and David Julius have done and how our bodies at a molecular level respond to the stimuli of the external world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. I just wanted to tell you that I'm reading um, your, your incredible book until the end of time right now and talk about someone explaining very difficult topics very clearly, uh, really, really enjoying it. No, thank you. Really appreciate that. Thanks a lot.
All right. Bye-bye. Bye. I want to thank our two guests today, David Julius and Ardem Potapudian, new Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine for joining us here today. And thank you too for joining us and feel free to sign up to the World Science Festival newsletter or subscribe to the World Science Festival YouTube channel so you become aware of when our programs go up online. And that is it today from the World Science Festival in New York.